So obviously a lot of these Native Americans are not going to react in a very positive way to being told that the land that they've lived on for, you know, hundreds of years, aside from previous land being stolen from them and occupied by uh, white settlers from Europe, we now have um, more land in the United States that we're going to take from you. And we've set this other land aside up that's, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles away from you. Um, and you got to get there. You know, actually, it's really for uh, several of these uh, tribes, it's thousands of miles away. Um, and you can get there however you need to get there. Pretty much that means walking. Um, but you have to leave. You know, people are not going to react very positively to that. So the Seminoles in Florida had uh, really sort of the most violent reaction. Um, when the soldiers went to uh, where the Florida Seminole territory to forcibly remove the Seminoles and walk them, uh, have them start walking to what is today Oklahoma to that Indian territory, the men and oh, they began sort of like surprise attacks, uh, like hit and run attacks, you know, guerrilla warfare type style against the American soldiers and the women and, and children would hide in like the swamps. If you've been to Florida, you know, the whole state is basically one giant swamp and they were able to put up a really good fight and, uh, the government sort of just like gave up on them and let them stay there. So, uh, so really that there's a lot of uh, Florida Seminole, actual Seminole Native Americans still living in Florida today. Um, and that's because their, you know, ancestors were able to stand their ground here and resist uh, being moved to that Indian territory. Things are going to go quite differently for the Cherokees. So the Cherokee Indians, uh, like I said, were, we would consider sort of the most, uh, you know, assimilated into white and European culture among any Native American tribe. Uh, they had their own schools. Uh, they had their own written language. They had a newspaper uh, that printed in English. They had their own constitution that was modeled after ours. Uh, like I said, some of them even held slaves. So it was sort of a shock to the Cherokee Nation that they would be told that they need to be forcibly removed if they don't go willingly uh, to Oklahoma. Uh, so the Cherokee Nation... Um, refuses to participate in this and they sue the state of Georgia for trying to make them move. And, um, the, the Cherokee Nation says, you know, in their argument in the Supreme Court case, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, he says, uh, they say that, um, you know, the Native Americans are a sovereign, which means independently ruled group. And the federal government cannot tell them not, I mean, sorry, not the federal government, but the state cannot tell them that they have to leave. Um, and John Marshall rules uh, in their favor. He says that, you know, the tribe is not subject to state laws, but he says they are not sovereign. You know, they're not subject to state laws, but that means that they are subject to federal laws. They're not sovereign. So, Georgia uh, forbids any white people from entering Cherokee territory without the state of Georgia's permission. Uh, they're essentially doing this to try to punish the Cherokee Nation for, you know, waging this um, court battle against them. They're trying to essentially cut them off from the people around them. And, you know, that'll hurt them with trade. It'll hurt them with uh, a lot of different things. And uh, there was uh, two missionaries. Uh, one of them was Samuel Worcester, uh, who you see pictured there. And he, they were, you know, missionaries who had been working with the Cherokee Nation for quite some time. And they would go there every day and they refused to comply with this. They said, you know, no, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We're going to keep going on to these Cherokee reservations in Georgia to keep working with these people. And because they, uh, you know, refuse to comply and they break the law here, they're thrown in jail. And Samuel Worcester sues the state of Georgia and says that they're not allowed to do this. And so uh, John Marshall, again, when this Supreme Court case, Worcester v. Georgia, makes it all the way to him, he rules, uh, predictably so, in favor of Samuel Worcester. He says that Georgia pat doing this is essentially passing state laws. And he just said in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia that they couldn't do that. So, um, Andrew Jackson being a total turd, you know, they say, you know, President Jackson, what do you think about this? You know, uh, so Chief Justice John Marshall is essentially saying uh, he's supporting the Cherokee Nation and saying that they don't necessarily have to move to this Indian Territory. And um, if you know, remember, think back to what the purpose of each branch of government is. It's 
Andrew, uh, the or not Andrew, I guess Andrew Jackson, the executive branch enforces the law, the legislative branch makes the law, and the uh, judicial branch interprets the law. So John Marshall here has interpreted the law to say that it does not require the Cherokee Nation to do these things that the federal government is saying they do. So whose job is it to enforce his ruling? It's the executive branch's job. It's Andrew Jackson's job. So they say, you know, President Jackson, what do you think of this? And he says, John Marshall made his ruling, let him enforce it. Meaning, I'm not going to do anything to support this. If John Marshall wants to stop uh, the military from forcing these Cherokee uh, people away out of their land, then he can go down there and do it himself. I'm certainly not going to because I don't agree with this ruling. So he is acting like a total baby here. So the Cherokee people, you know, through all of these court battles, realize that it doesn't matter what they do, that one way or another, Andrew Jackson's going to have his way. So they signed the Treaty of New Echota, and in that treaty, they basically agree to relocate, and they um, uh, get allotted the land that they're going to own uh, once they get to Oklahoma. So the path that they take from Georgia to Oklahoma is 8,000 miles long. Okay, this is uh, four times the length of the Oregon Trail. And we remember how many people we said died along the Oregon Trail. trail. 20,000 people died along the Oregon Trail over a series of years and years. And we are going to force 16,000 people out of their homes. Um, you know, a lot of them don't, aren't even allowed time to pack up their belongings. They're literally forcibly dragged from their homes and forced to walk 8,000 miles to Oklahoma in horrible conditions. Um, you know, a lot of them starve. Uh, there's hunger problems, malnutrition, exposure. You know, they're not uh, kept well from the elements. It's very hot. Uh, and then, you know, rain and things like that. Um, disease. There's a, a lot of rampant disease going through um, all of these people because they're you know, their immune systems are in harsh conditions, they're not very good, so they're contracting a lot of diseases, a lot of people are dying from that. Bandits, the soldiers aren't even protecting them from being attacked by bandits. So by the time they make it to uh, Oklahoma, 4,000 of them have died, a, f a fourth, a quarter of these Cherokee people who have, and these are men, women, children, elderly, every type of person, a quarter of these people have died along the journey, which is why we call this the Trail of Tears. So now let's start talking about the bank war. So remember I said you got you should think of three things you think of Andrew Jackson. You should think of Indian removal, the bank war, and the nullification crisis. So now we're going to start talking about the bank war. So let's stretch our minds back to uh, when we were going through Hamilton's economic plan. We started talking about the National Bank. <sighs> Now, when we created the first national bank, it came with a contract so that it would exist for a certain number of years. And when that contract was up, uh, we would have to renew the contract or we wouldn't have a national bank anymore. They decided to renew the contract. So in 1816, they created the second national bank of the United States. So it's the same, you know, institution. It pretty much does a lot of the same things. And, um... This one has a 20-year contract, means that it will run out in 1836. By 1836, they have to have made a new contract or there will no longer be a national bank. So the purpose of the second national bank is pretty much to regulate state banks. Um, like I said, the first national bank had gone away in 1811. And in those five years between 1811 and 1816, when the new one is contracted, state banks had become really, really popular. So uh, one of the new purposes of the Bank of the United States is going to be to regulate all of those and make sure the state banks are, you know, running properly and doing what they're supposed to be doing. So Andrew Jackson hated, hated, hated the National Bank, hated it as much as um, Thomas Jefferson did. And he, he hated it for several reasons, uh, one of which is just like uh, Thomas Jefferson, he didn't think the Constitution gave the government the power to make decisions like that. He didn't think that um, in the Constitution, you know, because it didn't say that the Congress or any other entity in the federal government had the power to create a bank, that it didn't have the power to create a bank. He called it a monster. So you see here in this political cartoon, it says General Jackson slaying the many-headed monster. These are the heads of the bank. Okay, this uh, giant many-headed snake thing is supposed to represent the National Bank. Um, Jackson also really distrusted paper money. So any institution that relied on paper money, he wasn't going to like. He really felt a deep distrust of paper money that related back to his childhood. <coughs> when he was really poor, 
he developed that distrust of banks and paper money, so he didn't like it. He also felt that the bank, uh, you can abbreviate the bank in your notes instead of continuously writing the Bank of the United States. You can abbreviate it by, by writing BUS, B-U-S, Bank of the United States. Um, he really thought that the bank uh, used its influence and its money in corrupt ways. He thought that, you know, the people who were in charge of the Bank of the United States would use that money somehow to arrange the election of different people into different positions who supported it, uh, which was a corrupt thing. He also thought that state banks were more likely to give loans and help to poor farmers. And that was really who Andrew Jackson's main supporters were. Uh, so obviously he would want to support an institution that supports his supporters. He said that the National Bank pretty much just supported wealthy northern co uh, companies. And Andrew Jackson is a southern man. So he has many, many reasons, like I said here, for not liking uh, the National Bank. So in the summer of 1832, Henry Clay, who you see there on the right, and Daniel Webster, who was a senator from Massachusetts, uh, the two of them introduced a new bill to recharter the bank. You know, the bank is going to be uh, over in 1836, so they're trying to get ahead of the game here um, by a couple of years to go ahead and write a recharter. Now, Obviously, they could have waited a little while, uh, but they decided not to, and there's a reason for that. So H Henry Clay and Daniel Webster are both members of a new political party called National Republicans. Uh, remember I said the Federalist Party dies out. This is sort of the replacement of the Federalist Party. So Henry Clay and Dam so Web Daniel Webster are both National Republicans. Remember, Andrew Jackson is a Democrat not their party. So because the bank isn't actually going to expire in four years, they think that they can use a new charter for the bank to hurt Andrew Jackson's chances at re-election. They think, you know, if we put this bill up uh, for him to sign or veto, one of two things will happen. Uh, you know, number one, either he will sign it and that will be great and we'll have a new bank and we won't have to worry about it. Or two, he'll veto it, and we can use that against him in the um, election campaign. We can say, you know, look at what he did. He's ruining our chances. That um, He's trying to destroy a necessary financial institution, blah, blah, blah. So they can use that against him. So they put up uh, this bill. It passes in Congress, and now it's up to Andrew Jackson. Is he going to sign it, or is he going to veto it? He vetoes it. Uh, on July 10th, Andrew Jackson vetoed the bill. So typically when a president vetoes a bill, he issues a short little uh, you know, reason as to why he's vetoing it. He doesn't have to. They just, most of the time, they do. Sort of how the Supreme Court issues an explanation to all of their major rulings. Andrew Jackson issues a statement as to his um, why he vetoed this bill, and it is way longer than any other veto explanation has ever been, and he's pretty much like going in on the National Bank and on the National Republicans for even thinking of rechartering the National Bank in this veto um, explanation. His reasons are basically that, you know, number one, it's unconstitutional. Number two, this bill gives the bank mo monopolistic advantages. So it basically makes it a monopoly. Um, on top of that, he says that there are political, economic, and social reasons for this action. You know, he says that it they interfere with the electoral process, that it's um, foreign investors are able to make money off of Americans thanks to the National Bank. Um, he even challenges John Marshall's ruling in McCullough v. Maryland. Remember McCullough v. Maryland? We talked about that at the beginning of this unit where John Marshall said that um, it wasn't legal for the state to tax a federal entity. He sided with James McCullough when the state of Maryland tried to tax the National Bank. He even challenges that ruling. He says it is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to help their selfish purposes. Basically saying that John Marshall only did what he did and the Congress is only doing what they're doing now to help themselves and that there's no other benefit to the National Bank. And he adds on at the end of his veto explanation that he himself is sort of the sole representative of the people of the United States, basically making it seem like he is the centerpiece of the United States government. So, like I said, he really goes in on the National Bank here.